Hi everyone, my name is Lahiri from ABC of Anesthesia and in this lecture we're going to go through the airway exam. So really my objectives are how to perform an effective airway exam, what each element means, the general inspection, mouth opening, mallon paddy, thorough mental distance, neck extension and jaw protrusion, the accuracy of these tests and then what to do based on your findings. So let's get started. I want to let you know I've got a number of resources out there, including the ABCs of Anesthesia and Anesthesia Copy Break podcast, as well as my YouTube channel. Now what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and courses, and clinical anesthesia courses as well. As always, join us on the usuals, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, as well as our Facebook page and group, ABCs of Anesthesia. Now, a lot of this information comes from three fantastic resources. So predicting the difficult airway, and this is an article in Continuing Education, Anesthesia and Critical Care and Pain, and this is by the British Journal of Anesthesia. There's the Airway Assessment, which is a fantastic ANSCA document by Bradley, Chapman, Crook and Greenland. And then Airway Assessment, Predictors of Difficult Airway. Again, an older article, but just has fantastic information. So the Airway Assessment is complex, and really you need to do a full assessment, including history, examination and relevant investigations. And then always take the context, which we'll go through in further videos. But just remember, even a reasonably easy airway is made difficult if the patient has other complications. Maybe they have active reflux, they're unfasted with a bowel obstruction. Maybe they have severe cardiorespiratory disease causing a very sick patient who deteriorates as soon as you've given the drugs for intubation. Or maybe it's an unfamiliar environment and equipment or an unfamiliar or experienced team who don't know exactly what you need at the right moment. And like with anything with anesthetics, the time from action to disaster is very quick and you need everything to be going your way to make sure the patient is safe. So our focus in this lecture is going to be the airway examination. So the whole point of this airway examination is going to be to check if there's going to be difficulty with bag mask ventilation using an LMA to ventilate and oxygenate or laryngoscopy and intubation, as well as front of neck access. So all of the things that we do are going to be to check if any of those interventions, oxygenation and ventilation, are going to be difficult. So we're going to go through the whole array of examination techniques out there, including general inspection, mouth opening, melon paddy, thorough mental distance, neck extension, and jaw protrusion, as well as using a whole four-step process to do everything really quickly, and a few of the lesser known examination techniques as well. So general inspection, we're looking for obvious features such as syndromes or congenital malformations, maybe obesity, maybe there's some facial features like masses, infections, or a beard, and then trauma and burns are some of the obvious things that can cause extreme difficulty with managing the airway. Now the first examination is mouth opening. So mouth opening, it's really best measured as inter-incisor distance, so the distance from the tip of one incisor at the top to the bottom. Now it's thought that less than five centimeter of inter-incisor distance means there might be difficulty with intubation and less than four centimeters difficulty passing the LMA and ventilating with the LMA. So now a few specifics, less than 3.7 centimeters, it's considered outside the normal range. And about two centimeters is about what you need to introduce those video laryngoscope blades like the CMAC um, or the GlideScope. Two centimeters of opening is needed for some of the intubating LMAs like the fast track and about 2.5 centimeters for a classic LMA. So again, really important values to know, but as soon as it's less than you know, four centimeters or even three centimeters, I'm predicting difficulty with LMA ventilation. So when I'm measuring mouth opening, I just get my patient to open their mouth. So open the mouth really wide. And then I have a look and I really just measure about the inter incisor distance. So here we have you know, over five centimeters, which is perfect. So the Mallon Paddy score, or now known as the modified Mallon Paddy score, because we've introduced a fourth grade. So really, this is the visibility of the pharyngeal structures, the tongue, the posterior pharynx, the uvula, soft and hard palate and tonsil pillar. So it really is the ratio of all of these structures and how much of that posterior pharynx you can see. Now importantly, it's done with a patient sitting with their mouth open, tongue protruding with no phonation at all. Now, when the grade is higher, it really means that there's the relative space in the oris pharynx is lacking and you might have difficulty displacing that tongue. Now here are the grades, so melon patty one, you can see the whole posterior pharynx, the whole of the uvula and the tonsillar pillars. And then melon patty two means you can only see part of the uvula, but still the posterior pharynx and the soft palate and hard palates. The melon patty three is where you can't really see the uvula, really can only see the soft palate and not the posterior pharynx. Now melon patty four is where you can only see the hard palate. You can't even see the soft palate 
or the posterior pharynx or the uvula. And it just shows that there's a lot of overcrowding within that space, which might mean, again, difficulty with having a view on laryngoscopy or even just cr crowding. So it may be, mean difficulty bag mask ventilating if you don't have an adjunct like a Gattel to get past all of these structures. Now, just to demonstrate on my colleague, now I first get the patient to be sitting upright and I just get them to open their mouth as wide as possible. So open your mouth wide and poke your tongue out. So I get them to protrude their tongue maximally. And as you can see there, we can see a lot of the oropharynx, but we can't see the bottom of the uvula. So this is the malum patty too. So again, it's really important that you don't have the patient phonic. So they're not making any vocalizations. So what I'll get you to do now is say ah, uh, to demonstrate this. When the patient says ah, the whole upper palate and soft palate, sorry, moves upwards and then shows more of the pharynx and the bottom of the uvula. So you can make a potentially lower grade into a better grade just by phonation. Now the malampetti depends on a lot of things. So again, phonation can cause a problem, but imagine the patient has a smaller mouth opening. Again, with a smaller mouth opening, the malampetti will decrease. So just close your mouth a little bit, poke your tongue out, and yeah, it's just far harder to see that uvula. Similarly, if you try to make your tongue a bit bigger, so press your tongue up towards the roof of your mouth, imagine a big tongue or infection or anything like that, all of these changes will decrease your malum patty grade. So now let's talk about the accuracy of the malum patty. So a malum patty grade of three or four is considered to have a sensitivity of 35%, specificity of 91%, um, and a positive predictive value, like most of these tests is gonna be pretty low, 21% for a malum patty three. Now there was a meta-analysis of about 177,000 patients that showed that only 35% of patients with a difficult intubation were identified as malum patty three or four. So again, in a situation where there's low prevalence of a problem, the positive predictive value or the ability of a test to determine uh, whether there's going to be a problem is always going to be low. So next is a thyroid mental distance. And this is a distance from the thyroid notch to the mental prominence with the neck fully extended. Less than six centimeters considered to be you know, at risk of a difficult intubation. Six to 6.5 centimeters is equivocal and greater than 6.5 centimeters means that there shouldn't be difficulty with intubation. Now, what this means is that if there's a shorter distance, it means that there's probably a more anterior larynx. It's close to the jaw, which means that when you're going in with the laryngoscope, it's not as easy to view. A, a, you know, a larynx that's lower down is gonna be easier to view than a larynx that's further up because there's a more acute angle there. And just to demonstrate the thyromental distance, what I'm gonna do is ask my colleague here to extend their neck fully. And then I measure the distance from the thyroid notch up to the mental prominence. That distance should be greater than six and a half centimeters. And as you can see, it is far greater than six and a half centimeters there. Now again, the accuracy of this test is about 7% sensitivity, 99.2% specificity, and as always, the positive predictive value seems very low in these tests, it's about 38.5% according to some studies. Now at the same time as doing the thyroid mental distance, I also check neck extension because the neck is already extended. So the neck should be able to go through a range of motion of greater than 90 degrees from flexion to extension. The other marker I use is that the mental prominence should rise above the greater occipital protuberance at the back of the back of the head when full extension is there. It really measures the cranial cervical mobility because imagine that you had impairment with that mobility, you wouldn't be able to align the axis. So as we've seen from my previous videos, you wanna be able to align the oral axis with the pharyngeal axis and the tracheal axis. And these are all initially completely misaligned. That extension of the neck goes a long way to helping align those axes. So again, to demonstrate on my colleagues, I simply ask them to extend their neck fully and then I look at the mental prominence and make sure that that rises above the greater occipital protuberance. So the patient sitting up, the mental prominence rises above the greater occipital protuberance. Now I'll get them to flex their neck as well. And that angle there from full flexion to full extension, go to full extension now, that's greater than 90 degrees. Now this can pose some difficulties. For example, if someone does have a problem with their range of motion, it's kind of hard to tell just from looking if the angle is less than 90 degrees. So you might need a specific method of measurement such as a goniometer. So now some data about the accuracy with neck extension. So if, the, if there's less than 80 degrees of movement, sensitivity is about 10%, specificity is about 98%, and the positive predictive value about 29.5%. So next we have draw protrusion. What we ask the patient to do is protrude their lower incisors in front of their upper incisors. So A means that the lower teeth are able to protrude in front of the upper teeth. B means that they can only get in line with the upper teeth. And then C, the lower teeth are unable to protrude beyond those upper teeth. And obviously B and C are the more at-risk grades for difficult intubation. 
Now, what restriction means is that, again, there's just less space available in the posterior pharynx. So again, you might have difficulty with pa the passage of air through bag mask ventilation or getting that view because there's this overcrowding of the structures there. A really good jaw protrusion means that you can create a lot of space and there's a lot of laxity in the tissues or just less crowding of those tissues as well. So with jaw protrusion, I simply ask the patient to try and protrude their lower jaw in front of their top jaw. So they get them to show me their teeth and protrude your lower jaw. That is a grade A. So you can see the low incisors extending beyond the upper incisors. Now a grade B would be when the incisors are in line. And so if the patient can't protrude the low incisors further than in line with the upper incisors, that's a grade B. So grade C means that the low incisors are not able to protrude past the incisor or even in line with them, and that could present a difficulty with intubation. So now for the accuracy of jaw protrusion, the sensitivity about 16%, specificity 95.8%, and positive predictive value about 20%. Now the upper lip bite test is a variation of the jaw protrusion test. So essentially, either the lower incisors are able to bite above the vermilion border of the lip, or the lower incisors can just bite the vermilion border, or they're unable to bite the upper lip. And grades two and three are considered worse grades. A grade two or three, again, means the same with jaw protrusion. There's just less space in the posterior pharynx and less jaw mobility to get a view on laryngoscopy. So with the upper lip bite test, I simply ask my patient to try to bite the upper lip as far above their lip as possible. Beautiful. So as you can see, he's able to bite his lip above the vermilion border. That's uh, a grade one. A grade two, if you were to decrease that, you can see that the bite is just around the vermilion border of the upper lip. And then a low grade, or grade C, or grade three rather, is can't bite the upper lip at all. Now the accuracy with this test, the sensitivity is about 78%, specificity 91%, and the accuracy about 91%. So this, I don't have the positive predictive value for this test, but again, the positive predictive value is invariably from a range of 20 to 40%, so definitely low. So obviously there's a whole bunch of tests and exams, and it might sound confusing, but in real life, we can do those in a very simple four-step process that's very efficient and effective for just examining the whole airway. Now my complete four-step process to take a history, which I'll go through in another video, inspect again for their age, beard, BMI, malformations, trauma, uh, burns, or any other obvious deformities. When the mouth is open, I calculate the malum patty. I also look for you know, tongue, prominent teeth, and the inter incisor distance. Then with the mouth closed, I look at jaw protrusion and then get the patient to extend the neck to check neck extension and the thyromental distance. So that's my four-step airway assessment, and it's really quite straightforward. And once you get used to it, you can do it very quickly in about five seconds. So just to demonstrate this four-step airway exam, obviously in my full assessment, I'll take a history, but then afterwards I want to do a general inspection very quickly. And often you'll know when there's a problem, but there's obvious trauma malformations, burns, or any other facets of their facial features that might prove difficult. I then have the patient open their mouth and I check for prominent teeth, the inter incisor distance. I get them to poke their tongue out and that's looking at the malum patty. It's malum patty two over there. And again, any other obvious masses or any problems in the airway. I then have the patient close their mouth and check the jaw protrusion. So I'll get them to push your lower jaw in front of your top jaw and show your teeth. And that's again, jaw protrusion A. Now the patient can relax that and then I'll get them to extend the neck so again, at this point, I'm looking at the full range of neck motion, as well as looking at the thyromental distance, which should be greater than six and a half centimeters. In that same motion, I might get them to do neck flexion just to prove that they've got a full range of motion and then back up again. Fantastic. So that is my four step airway examination and it can be done very quickly. Now, there's a couple of other tests that I don't use commonly and this is the sternomental distance and the mandibular higher distance. And in diabetics, there's some, a couple of specific tests, namely the palm print, as well as the prayer sign. Now with the sternal mental distance, we're looking at the distance in full neck extension and the mouth closed from the sternal, some, from the supersternal notch up to the mentum. So instead of the thyro mental distance, there's a sterno mental distance. Now, less than 12 centimeters probably indicates difficult intubation. And again, you can see why if there's problems with neck extension or an anterior larynx or a smaller jaw, then you might foresee there's gonna be difficulty. So the mandibular high distance is the distance from the mentum to the hyoid bone, which sits around here. Now it's again in the neck fully extended with the mouth closed and less than four centimeters might indicate difficult intubation. And you can see what this probably means. It probably means that there's a shorter mandible and getting overcrowding of structures with a short mandible will pose difficulty with intubation.
Now the palm print means that you paint the right hand with blue ink and you then press the hand on paper. So you have grade zero to three, where grade zero is all the phalangeal areas are visible. Grade one is there's a deficiency in the interphalangeal areas of the fourth and fifth digits. And grade two, deficiency in interphalangeal areas of two to the fifth digits, with grade three only the tips of the digits seen. So you can imagine that if someone has stiffening of their collagen fibers and their tissues, you won't be able to flatten that hand down on paper and you'll only get the tips there. And that probably indicates there's gonna be difficulty in movement of the tissues. The prayer sign is where you bring the palms together in a prayer pose. Now it's positive or a bad sign if there is a gap between the palms, but it's negative if there's no gap between the palms. And again, this might indicate that there's stiffening of the tissues due to long-standing diabetes and stiffening of the collagen. Now just to demonstrate the sternomental mental distance, again, just like with the thyroid mental distance, have your patient with, your, with the mouth closed, extending their neck fully, and I'm just looking down at the suprasternal notch, which just is around here, and then taking that distance up to the mental prominence. Now this is a little bit more difficult to measure, but it's harder to measure larger distances just by eye, eyesight than smaller distances, but that should be less than, if, if it's less than 12 centimeters, that's maybe a problem. The mandibular higher distance, again, in the same position from the mental prominence down to where the higher bone is, which is just about there, and that should be greater than four centimeters, less than four centimeters, may pose a problem. Now, when checking for the prayer sign in these long-standing diabetic patients, ask the patient to put their hands together in the prayer pose. Now, a good sign is that you can't see any gaps between the fingers, which is pretty good there. Now, if you were to increase the gap and show a bit of curvature, patients with very stiff tissues might have more of a gap. And that's obviously exaggerated there, but that will show a gap if there's problems with their tissues being stiff. So you might be thinking, what about combining these tests? If each individual test isn't that great with their positive predictive value, maybe combining the tests will be better. But these studies show that even combined tests are still bad at predicting in low prevalence populations. So you know, the fact is that difficult intubation is a very unlikely scenario. And so in low prevalence populations, single tests or combined tests are still not that great. So there's a couple of combined tests that I'll mention, the Wilson and the Arn systems, and they both have low positive predictive values. Now with the Wilson system, they look at weight, head and neck movement, jaw movement, receding mandible and buck teeth, and you get a score. And depending on the score, you might have you know, a difficult intubation or not. Now the Arn system is actually interesting because they talk about previous knowledge of difficult intubation, as well as a whole bunch of other things, pathologies associated with difficult intubation, clinical symptoms of airway pathology, the inter-incisor gap and mandible look luxation, thyroid mental distance, maximum range of head and neck movement, modified melon patty, and then you get a total possible score. <laughs> and then you get a score from that as well. Now, interesting knowledge of a previous difficult intubation is probably one of the best positive predictive value tests that you can do on history. And because the ARN risk index actually uses that, you'll find that its positive predictive value is higher than some of the others. Now, this is a table just showing a compilation of all the different sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. And you can see that the ARN is actually a little bit higher. It has a range of 25 to 42% positive predictive value. So that's a chance of if a test is positive, the chance of that patient will have a difficult intubation. But note that the history of difficult airway itself is about 69%. So, you know, if you are ever going to do one thing to find out whether a patient is a difficult intubation, bag mask ventilation, or LMA ventilation, simply check a previous record or a patient letter. And if they have any difficulty, then you know that there's a really good chance that it might be difficult for you, especially if it was done by an experienced practitioner. So now we've run through a whole number of different tests. And I've told you that even though we do these tests, that they might actually have a really low positive predicted value. So, you know, what's the point of doing these tests? Well, first of all, there's certain signs that will almost guarantee a difficult airway. So imagine these extreme deviations from normal. Say a patient has no mouth opening. That means that introducing an LMA or a laryngoscope and getting a view would be virtually impossible with that. So extreme deviations will cause extreme problems. Maybe that patient has a fixed neck. So the patient has no movement of the neck at all. That means that again, you cannot align the axes and get a good view. And a lot of these situations are trauma or ankylosing spondylitis with severe deformity. Maybe the patient has super morbid obesity. And again, that just presents a real problem with positioning and a lot of overcrowding of tissues as well. Now, the obvious thing is any malformations, tumors, severe obstructions, congenital issues like Trucher Collins or Pierre Robin syndrome, again, present extreme difficulty. Now imagine a traumatic airway with the structures all deformed, as well as blood and other soiling of the airway, again, that's going to pose obvious difficulty, and you don't need a test to know that. 
Now, even if the airway might be fine, maybe the tests are all reassuring and there's no obvious problems, think about the other context. For example, you might have a sick patient, an unfamiliar environment, unfamiliar equipment, inexperienced staff who don't know whether to hand you this piece of equipment or what the names are or something like that. Or maybe the patient has a severe aspiration risk. Just remember that an easy airway in a bad context will still be difficult for you and you've got to take that into account. So my summary is that there's many, many different tests and all of them have a low positive predictive value. And that's simply because the chance of difficult intubation, difficult mass ventilation, difficult LMA ventilation is pretty unlikely in the general population. And the chance of all three of them being impossible is extremely, extremely low, about one in 10,000 to one in 20,000. So why do we do these examinations? I mean, the known difficult airway is going to be obvious because they're going to be extreme deviations from normal. But what it does remind me is to actually check for these extreme deviations. So it reminds us that we should do the an airway inspection, make sure that all the parameters are reasonable and okay. And it reminds us to formulate a plan and then communicate it to our team. So as much as I teach these exams, and I think it's really important to know what these examinations mean. Um, it's part of anesthesia tradition and culture, and it really allows you to know what other people are talking about and communicate difficulties to someone else. But what's really important is that you have a plan, that you communicate it, and you proceed down that plan in a practical and effective way without delay. So in summary, I want you to really know all the different airway exams, general inspection, mouth opening, melon patty, thyromental distance, and neck extension. I want you to know the correct technique and what each technique actually means, as well as the overall accuracy, and then an overall approach to airway management. So my take home message is that the very difficult airway will be easy to identify because they're extreme deviations from normal. The unanticipated difficult airway will often be a surprise. So what's far more important is to optimize each technique well, whatever you're using, bag masking, LMA or intubation, move to the next plan without fixation, and do not persist at a failing technique because repeated attempts at a technique may traumatize the airway, making a difficult airway impossible. So again, thanks so much for watching. Please share with anyone who might be interested and we'll see you in the next video.